Well, as Trungpa Rinpoche used to say whenever he began a talk, good morning, everyone. <laughs> I think he was trying to tell us to wake up. So welcome. Um, can all hear? Yes. Some nods. Thank you. Okay. So tonight, um, Laura and I are going to present the material and we'll have discussion. And I'm going to go first, we'll just fill out that way. Um, this is very rich material, to say the least. This is really core Buddhist doctrine. Um, it's fundamentals, which, isn't, which doesn't mean to say that it's trivial or easy at all, uh, but it is studied by all Buddhists, whether they're Theravada Buddhists of Southeast Asia, um, Mahayana Buddhists, wherever they may be, China, Vietnam, um, Japan, Mongolia, Korea, or Vajrayana Buddhists in Tibet, and um, a little bit of Vajrayana Buddhism in Mongolia, or more than a little, and a little bit in Japan, all studied this doctrine that we're going to be talking about tonight. It's core, foundational, and profound. What this is, is the basic description of neurosis, of samsara, of confusion, of what it means to be unenlightened. And what the teachings tell us is that if you understand unenlightenment, confusion, samsara, if you understand it perfectly, that is the same as enlightenment. So you can listen to the descriptions of reality and awakened mind and aspire to that, which is a two-edged sword, that aspiration, because the aspiration becomes another mechanism of confusion. Or you can listen to these descriptions of confusion, or as Trungpa Rinpoche used to like to call it neurosis, using the Western psychological term, and achieve the same thing, awakening. Because the thing is that we're asleep. We are going through the processes that are described in what we're going to be talking about tonight with little or no self-awareness, awareness of these processes. And if we become completely aware, then we're not in them anymore. We're not trapped. I'm going to say this more than once, I think. One way to think about this is of figure and ground. And in fact, those terms, while they're very Western figure and ground, they have their very, very close analogs in the Buddhist teachings. In the Buddhist teachings, they speak of the ground. The term is um, Ji in Tibetan. It's the ground of our being. And the figure is confusion, which plays out against the ground. What does this mean? What it means is, in an experiential sense, we are constantly in a state of awareness. Just right now, you can't shut it off. You're aware of something, as long as you're not dead. And at the same time, playing against that background awareness that never stops are the thoughts and the emotions and the ideas and all of this stuff which rises and passes away. Do I understand this? No, I don't understand this. Yes, I do understand this. Meanwhile, we're having awareness of the room, of this voice. Now that I mentioned it of your bottom on the whatever you're sitting on, 
what are called the six knowables, all arising and passing away in space, the space of this present moment. You can't shut it off. It changes all the time, every instant. One instant you're listening to this voice, the next minute there was silence. One minute you're looking at this picture, the next minute you might be looking at somebody else's picture or something on your table or whatever it might be. One minute you're aware of the taste in your mouth, the next minute you're thinking a thought about your mother, your lover, your friend, your brother, who knows. So it's a figure ground. The ground is the awareness that is always with us. The figure plays out from time to time and is constantly a conversation that we have with ourselves about our experience or about things in the past and the future, always about that. And in those conversations, there is always a hero or a heroine, which is I. I am going to, I did, I hope, I fear, I want, I regret, I, I, I. And those thoughts in the figures are full of anxiety. Anxiety about what? About I. How's I doing? You know, what's going to happen to this I tomorrow or tonight or in the next instant? What did happen? And when we think about what did happen, it's with regret if we can't hold on to it, it was good. It's with relief if it was bad, we don't want it again. And I, there was a, I always like to quote Fritz Perls, he was the guy who invented Gestalt therapy, um, famous psychoanalyst who said that all thoughts about the past are really thoughts about the future because we think about the past in terms of our future, hoping for what was pleasurable in the past, wanting to avoid what was not in the future. And these are the figures that play out against the ground of our being. The ground of our being is we're walking down the street, we're sitting in our chair, in our room. You, you can't stop that. And what these descriptions are that we're going to go through tonight are all about the figure, the thoughts, the stories that we tell ourselves that involve us in suffering, in confusion, in feelings that we don't know We were looking for an answer and we don't know what it might be, we think, in the figure. So there are, this is really, and all of this is depicted in the wheel of life. Now, I encourage you, I should have I put it on screen, but I didn't. I don't have one on my computer that's good. Just Google it, the wheel of life. It's the main, one, one of the most important Buddhist heuristics. It's a, a teaching device, graphic. And what the wheel of life consists of is this very wrathful, fearsome looking guy whose name is Yama. Yama is death, but he's more than death. Yama is the space of birth and death. It all arises, thank you. Who did that? There we go. Everybody see that? Give me a few nods if you do. Yes, okay. There he is, Yama. And you can see this is the wheel. He's holding it in, in his arms and feet and his teeth. He's got this tiger down there below him. If you could see the bottom, um, I forget what's down there. But what this wheel consists of are what we're going to be talking about tonight. On the outer ring of the wheel, there are 12 little pictures, and these are the 12 nidanas. These are the 12 links of the chain of karma. It's actually called the 12 links of dependent co-origination. 
because all of these links arise and in sequence simultaneously, both, and they are this stuff, the sort of the mechanism of the stories that we tell ourselves. Thank you, Laura. You can see it. So that's these right around here, and we're going to be talking about them. There, here in this area, we have what are called the six realms, and Laura is going to be talking about the six realms tonight. These are the psychological portraits of neurosis. So the 12 links are the mechanism of neurosis, and these are the psychological portraits of neurosis. Um, and these are, we, we all experience these six realms from time to time. And in the center here, um, this is just a sort of the progression uh, from birth to death and around the circle of uh, from going down into hell and up and back. But in the center here are the, is the heuristic of the three poisons. We'll be talking about that tonight. Um, the poisons are aggression, ignorance or indifference, and passion. And they're represented by a pig, a rooster or a bird, and a snake. So, okay. Which is which? Which is which? The rooster or the, the bird is passion. The um, pig, I can't see it very well, is ignorance or sloth. And the snake is aggression. Uh, thank you. Yeah. You'll see very many, many versions of the Wheel of Life. Some of them are much better drawn than others, and uh, they're, some of them are quite incredible. But they all have these basic points. Some of them also have a Buddha figure um, appearing in each one of the six realms or just on the edge of it. And these are called Munis. And the reason that those Buddha figures appear there is that confused beings in each of the realms find the teacher that they need according to their needs and obscurations. So it's like each one of us finds what we need to move towards enlightenment and all beings. This is from the Dzogchen teachings. All beings are proceeding inexorably to enlightenment. It may take eons, but then time is just a figment of our imagination anyhow. So we start with uh, these three poisons. I'll just mention them uh, first. I'm going through this chapter. Um, the basic idea is this. The fundamental problem is that we have in our figure, remember the figure in the ground, conceived of the existence of an other out there. What it means is that against this ground, suddenly something emerges as being existent or dominant or important and everything else fades into relative unimportance. It becomes a figure. We can have a figure in our thoughts. We can have a figure just in an object. You can see another person and you can say, oh, there's Jesse. And suddenly everything else fades into relative unimportance and Jesse is there. And the very existence of Jesse implies the existence of the perceiver here of the ground. This is ignorance. This is the birth of ignorance. The birth, it's the fundamental mistake. We lose track of the whole field and suddenly there's an other and an I, and there's a journey that happens. If the other is there, then it's an implication. Therefore, I am here. That journey is important because it is an action that has a beginning and an end. And when it ends, the whole I other game dissolves. 
but we don't want it to dissolve because we want I to stay alive. We all want that. We all want I to be healthy and present. And, and so what we do is we reach out and we make a relationship with that other. And this is going to be described here. Now, when you've got two things, I and other, there are basically three ways that they can relate. They can get closer together, they can get further apart, and they can stay the same distance. These are the three poisons. If you see that other as dangerous or inimical, threatening, well, you want to get distant from it and you push it away. This is aggression. If you see the other as friendly, as something that's going to bolster your well being, then you want to draw it to you. This is the passion of the three poisons. And if you don't really care, if the other is sort of indifferent or neutral, then you just stay the same distance. And these are the three fundamental poisons because they're poisons because they have to do with, they, they expand out as we're going to see. And they are the core of this neurotic, untrue relationship between this imagined, temporarily created other out there and this imagined and non-existent I here. The I is just the other pole of this conversation. And when the conversation stops, I evaporates. Here's a quote from Trungpa Rinpoche. Seeing the truth as it is, the goal as well as the path, by discovering the truth of samsara, confusion, neurosis, you are discovering nirvana. In fact, the reality of samsara is equally the reality of nirvana. So if you see it, you're free of it. But we aren't, are we, a lot of the time, speaking for myself. And in this experience, this wheel of life, um, Yama is usually called the Lord of Death, but he is more than that. He is the space in which death and birth continually alternate. Everything is, you make a gesture and as it's born, it's dying. These words coming out of my mouth, as they appear, they're disappearing. This is Yama. He is the environment in which everything arises and passes. In the foreground, remember the ground, the figure against the ground. He is the personification of death who provides the space and time for birth, death, and endurance. Now the endurance is figurative. It just, because as a thing is seeming to endure, it's already dying. Now the description of how we get into this error is called the 12 Nidanas or the 12 links of karma. And I'm going to go through them. I sent out a document to everybody who's given me their email. And if you haven't, you can put it in chat and I'll send it to you after the class. And in this document um, are listed, it's simple, it's just something you can refer to, the 12 Nidanas, the 12 links, and also, um, these six realms are listed. There's a, this, this teaching is so profound. Um, when you go for formal teachings in a Tibet, in a uh, traditional um, setting, you will chant um, a chant in Sanskrit. Uh, it's even the Tibetans chanted in Sanskrit. And what it says basically is that the Buddha, the great sage taught the teachings of the 12 nidanas. And what the 12 nidanas are also called are dependent co-origination. And what that means, dependent co-origination, is that everything that arises, arises in dependence on everything else. It's a constant presentation of arising and passing away independence. And 
you can look at the nidanas as the description of neurosis, which they are, of confusion. But at the same time, because everything is arising in, in, in close dependence on everything else, nothing has its own being. Everything is part and participating in something else. And this becomes another version of the doctrine of emptiness, which is the doctrine of reality, that no thing has its own being. Everything is part of the whole, a constantly changing, shifting part of this whole that presents itself. And because everything is just a part of this shifting, endlessly changing whole, nothing exists in its own right. Everything, and this is the meaning of shunyata, the doctrine of shunyata, which you get to in the Mahayana, which is usually called voidness or emptiness. Shunya means void or empty. Ta is a nominative. So it becomes voidness or emptiness. Void of what? Void of its own being. Everything is just a constant flux. Now, the 12 Nadanas, they start with, um, if you looked at that heuristic, if you get a, get a copy of it, the very first one, which is at the top, is the blind grandmother. <laughs> and she's blind because she can't see her progeny. It's very hard to see her in this drawing. Let's see. She, I think she's wearing the, uh, the orange robe. Yeah, Laura's pointing it out to us. And she represents ignorance. Now the word for ignorance in Sanskrit is very interesting. It's a vidya. A is a is a negative. It means not. Vidya is the word to see, to see truly. To see what? To see the ground. So what ignorance is is ignoring, not seeing the ground. A vidya. We, we, it's usually translated as ignorance and we think we, we don't know something, but it literally means not seeing, not seeing what the ground of our being. And we walk around, it's like we walk around thinking, 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 all kinds of anxious thoughts. And we are ignoring the day, this beautiful day, or whatever it might be, this rainy day, this cold day, this cold evening, who knows what we're ignoring, this room, because we're thinking, we're thinking anxious unhappy thoughts. And if we're thinking happy thoughts, they contain within them the pain of losing them. We know that they're only temporary. So the blind grandmother, she's blind because she doesn't see the ground. And then the second link, which leads, she leads to inexorably, is what's called samskara, the image is of a potter and his wheel. And what this means is that once we begin to get into I other relationships, we form patterns that are described in the foreground of our thought, in our thoughts. And these patterns become habitual. So let's say you had um, an angry parent and that memory of that parent is stored in your unconscious, to use the Freudian term. There's a Buddhist equivalent that's much older than Freud. They call it the alia, the storehouse. That's where all memories are stored, as seeds. And that memory of that angry parent is very powerful for you because you, it was your childhood. So one day you're walking down the street and somebody is approaching you and they look just like that angry parent and all those feelings arise within you. And you have a reaction to that person, even though you've never laid eyes on them before, but they remind you. And so it brings that up and you start to have a reaction to them. You might actually walk, you know, give them a wide berth. Or if you have to encounter them, you might say something to them and it will be colored by those feelings from that memory. And we walk through our days constantly doing this. This is samskara. 
And what samskara means is conceptual formulations. Formulations like, I don't like people who look like my angry parent, you know, or whatever it might be. You do like people who look, who remind you of, of your loving parent and you're attracted to them. And you head towards them. This is samskara. It's called the potter's wheel because you are building a mechanism of neurosis, a mechanism of patterns of behavior based on past experience and being projected into the future, into the present and the future. There are two ways that these samskaras come to life. One is, as I just described, something happens in the present moment which triggers one of those patterns and it comes, they call, they're called habitual patterns because they're habitual, they're habits. The other is <coughs> that the storehouse just kicks them out. Like at night when you're dreaming and you have some nightmare, you know, based on your past experience, a compilation of different things all coming together and you have a nightmare and it kicks it out. So those two ways in which the samskaras come to life, come into our experience. These are the mechanisms, and this is all called the past, because right now we're in the present, but ignorance and samskara, all that is took place in the past, was created in the past. And it's the cause of what we have now in the present. So let's move to the third nidana, which is the beginning of the description of this present moment. And the third is consciousness. And it's symbolized by a monkey because <laughs> we've got monkey mind. You know, as you know from trying to sit, your mind just jumps around all the time from thought to thought and occasionally comes back to the ground. The ground is just this open space with whatever is presenting itself. If you're working with the breath, the ground might be the breath going out into space. If you're working with Vipassana awareness, the ground is just this room wherever you're sitting. And the monkey is all those thoughts jumping around. Now we're in the present, you see? And he is the product of ignorance and samskara, the accumulations. He, she, that monkey. He's a very busy monkey. <laughs> yeah. So then the fourth is called name and form. And what it really amounts to is this, that we begin to elaborate um, our psychological mistake, this I other mistake. And it takes form a form of what are called the five skandhas. And um, we've covered them, I think, didn't we cover them in another chapter? And I really don't want to go through it again, um, the five skandhas. What they are, are the five ways we buttress and elaborate this I-other relationship to keep it going. Because we don't want it to stop. It has an inherent inertia in it. And the inertia is to keep it going, to keep that motion going. We want to keep it alive. We want to keep busy. We want to be entertained. I is fundamentally always seeking entertainment. And sometimes that entertainment is painful and sometimes it's pleasurable. But even when it's pleasurable, it's fundamentally painful because we know the pleasure is short-lived. So that's the fourth, nama rupa. It means name and form. And basically what it's saying is that now we're going to cover a lot of this as we go on further, what name and form is. The fifth nidana is the six senses. They're called uh, the six ayatanas. Um, ayatanas are combinations of the eye and the visual object, the ear, 
and the auditory object, the nose and the olfactory object, the tongue and the gustatory object, and the body and the tactile object, and then the mind and the mental object. So we've got six things to see. This is called the six faculties. And the image for this is that the monkey is trapped now in a house with six windows. That's the metaphor. And jumping around excitedly. That's our excited mind. One minute we're you know, appreciating a piece of candy. The next minute we're looking at the weather. The next minute we're listening to a piece of music. We're mon that's our monkey mind jumping around inside this house. Remember, I'm only talking now in this about neuro neurosis, because at any time, at any time, you can come back to meditation, which means awareness of the ground. The, that's the fifth one, the six fa uh, sense faculties. The sixth one, number six, is contact. And what that means is this, in the, in the images of a um, married couple embracing, or just a couple of lovers embracing, contact, sparsha in Sanskrit. And what it's saying is that now we've got these six senses and the eye and its object meet. And when they meet, there is going to be the next Ayatana, next Nidana, excuse me, which is uh, feeling. There's going to be a feeling generated between the organ and the object of awareness. So you see a beautiful sunset and the feeling is pleasure. You see um, something ugly and you feel revulsion. Same thing with all of the senses. We have contact and then we have feeling. And once there is feeling generated, then we go to the seventh ayatana, which is, and this is all in the present now. This is the picture of the present. And this is the last one in the present, which is feeling. That having had contact, now there's a feeling. It's a pleasurable feeling if you see a beautiful sunset. It's an unpleasant feeling if you see something ugly and it's a neutral feeling if you don't care and we can have all kinds of feelings so that's the seventh nidana and this is choiceless what that feeling is it's determined by past karma it's the way in which you've been patterned by your experience and the symbol for this is an arrow in the eye nice huh <laughs> Nothing if not colorful. This concludes the picture of the present moment. And this now propels us into what is going to happen in the future, karma. So the next nidana coming out of that feeling of the sixth, seventh, is the eighth one is what's called trishna, which is craving thirst. And the symbol for this is a uh, person drinking milk and honey. Now the craving can be positive or negative. It can be a craving to get away from a painful situation. It can be a craving to get closer to a pleasurable one. And what's very interesting here is that in the transition between the feeling and the craving, this is where we have the opportunity to step out of this 12 linked chain, to break the chain of karma. How? Simply by becoming aware. By stop, we, we, we stop moving in this dynamic pattern through the 12 Nadanas and we break the chain by coming aware of what? Of the ground here, now, what's always with us. We let go of the thinking, the thoughts, and we come present. Very simple. It's effortless. But usually we're so caught up in this developing story 
that we just rush on into the future. So the past Nadanas, numbers three through seven, were effect. They were the effect of the first two. The first two were, remember, were um, the blind grandmother, ignorance, and the second one was the potter and the wheel, which is uh, karma. And those two are a cause, and they produce the effect, which is your life in the present moment, which is described, you know, in terms of uh, name and form and uh, consciousness first, the, uh, number three, and then name and form, number four, and then uh, number five, which is the six senses, number seven uh, is, um, number six is contact, and number seven is feeling, the arrow in the eye, and those are the product of the first two, and they are also a description of the present. Now we're moving into a cause again, which is going to produce the future. And the first one of these is the Trishna, the craving, the thirst. And the second, or the number nine, is grasping, upadana. That having developed a thirst for something, positive or negative, then we want to go into action. We want to grab it or push it away from us. And that's upadana. So Trishna, the thirst, does not involve any activity, but now we act, putting our thirst into action, and this is going to create karma. Karma, see what karma is, is entrapment in the story of the 12 Nadanas. We are entrapped in this forward momentum. And having exercised grasping, upadana, then we move to the 10th nadana, which is becoming. And the image here is of a couple copulating. They're having sex and they're going to produce something with their sexual encounter. And the idea is simply that having experienced desire or aversion, that number eight, no, that's number uh, seven, um, then we have a um, craving, number eight. And number nine, we go into action, um, upadana. We begin to enact our craving and number 10, having begun to enact it, then we begin to move into a new state. We begin to, we're copulating, we're going to produce something. And that's the 10th Nidana. I'm just gonna read you something here. So Nidana's eight through 10 involve manipulating, ignoring or harming others. They produce future surf suffering for us, birth in the lower realms. We're going to get to the realms next. We can also create positive karma, though still with ego, by doing good things. However, negative actions produce a stronger sense of self. Meritorious actions, good, good actions, produce a weaker sense of self, which is actually closer to enlightenment. And we said how between seven and eight, between uh, feeling and desire, there's a gap in the process of ego. And this is the point where we have freedom. We can resist acting on, can we resist acting on our thirst? Or are we driven on like rats in a pack, he says. We can stay with our pleasure and pain without doing anything about it. And this is the purpose of meditation, is to see it, become aware, step out of the story that we've been telling ourselves and in which we become trapped and wake up and see the day, the quality of the day. And this is mindfulness. 
a gap in which we can see things stripped of the value judgments that attach to feeling, that nidana of feeling. When we feel something, it's full of value judgments. It feels good, it feels bad, if we're indifferent. And then if we are going to keep going from copulation, bhava, becoming, see, it's like becoming doesn't literally mean giving birth to a, a living sentient being. You might be giving birth to a new situation with yourself. You know, you might be giving birth, you see a person who attracts you. And so, you know, you feel this desire, you see them, you feel, you, feel the quality, Vedana, feeling, and then you have a desire, yes, that person attracts me. And then you um, start to enact that desire and you get into um, number 10, becoming. You actually say, hi, what's your name? And now you're beginning to get into a relationship and you're becoming a new situation, a new version of yourself. And this is the 10th um, Nidana becoming copulation, which leads to the 11th and which the image is a woman in childbirth. And this is birth, Jati. And now you're actually giving birth to a new situation which, and now this is the future, jati, because you're going to give birth and birth inevitably implies death, which is the 12th nidana, jara marana. And so whatever you give birth to is going to die. That love affair that you entered into, sooner or later, it will have a death of one kind or another. If it doesn't die as a relationship, then sooner or later, one of the partners will die. And then both. And this is the wheel. And when that dies, then consciousness looks, whatever situation, so you, let's say it's a, a love affair and the love affair dies, and then your consciousness is now sort of stunned and looking for a new situation. And that's, we're back to the blind grandmother giving birth. These nidanas happen in sequences that over time, they also happen and arise instantaneously in the present moment. You know, you see something, you're walking down the street and they, they can just go almost in an instant. Very, very, very quickly. They can also progress. You can look at your, your whole life in terms of nidanas, how you got to where you are today or a particular aspect of your life, your relationship with your lover, your, your significant other, and how that's progressing. And what it's really saying is that what confusion is, is the evolution of this story that's described in the Nidanas. Confusion is, this is karma. We are enslaved to karma, bound by the karmic chain and what the karmic chain is, is this evolving story that's described in the 12 Nadanas. And the 12 Nadanas are things like ignoring the very first one. And then um, the second one, which is um, the, the karma coming up and determining how you act. And the third one is the feeling of I, consciousness. And the fourth is, you know, beginning to name and categorize things. And then we go to the fifth and the sixth and we get feeling and we've got you know, grasping. And these, the involvement, the constant involvement in this, these evolving stories is what keeps us on this treadmill, treadmill of suffering. Going around and around, trying to find pleasure, watching it being born, dying. And the only real escape and this is what the Dharma is all about, the path, is to come present. 
This is the act of what meditation is. When you begin to practice meditation and you just start watching the breath or some object of awareness, maybe you did TM, transcendental meditation, and you became aware of a sound, a mantra. You work with a mantra. If you're a Buddhist, you probably worked with the breath. The instant you start doing that, you are stepping out of the 12 nadanas, stepping out of the karmic chain because you are coming present. This is what mindfulness means. Mindfulness means cutting that chain, coming present. It's not awareness yet. Awareness brings understanding, but this brings a huge relief mindfulness because we're no longer caught up in the angst, in the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of fear. Whenever we come present in mindfulness, this is why mindfulness is, has made such a huge impact in the workplace, in hospitals, because it relieves people of anxiety, the anxiety that's contained in, this, in the thoughts, which are patterned according to the 12 Madonnas. And then beyond that, we practice awareness meditation and we begin to see this pattern and we begin to understand it, see it in ourselves, which further buttresses our ability to step out of it. And more than that, we begin to see the ground. We haven't been paying attention to the ground. We've been so focused on the figure, on what I am going to get for me or avoid or whatever, the story. And when we begin to focus on the ground, we begin to see the ground, which is the whole purpose of Vipassana meditation, awareness meditation, which we practiced here together today. When we begin to do that, then we begin to actually step into reality. So I'm gonna stop here. It's already, whoa, I'm wondering if we ought to, <laughs> is it 8.30 in New York? Yes. Laura, I'm wondering if we ought to take this into a second week and you do the um, round. Yeah. Is that all right with you? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Because there's so much in this material and it's really terrific stuff. And if you want to read another presentation of this, I, there's one that I recommend, uh, Reginald Ray wrote a book called Indestructible Truth. And um, in it, he's got a very good description of the 12 Nadanas. It's very helpful. Maybe if I can, I, if I can find it, I'll send it out in a PDF. But if you have the book, Indestructible Truth, I recommend the section on the 12 Nadanas. So let's do that. Let's, the, 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 it's too rich, the, the six realms. And I'm glad that Laura can do it next week because we really need to give it its due. So we can have a Q&A now, discussion. Comments, complaints. Hi, uh, I was- uh, Boring. Um, I, hello, <laughs> I was, um, uh, the wheel of life, I have two questions. One, the wheel of life, um, is that have to do with, uh, they talk about the, uh, was it the three wheels, uh, the Buddha's three spinnings of the wheel or something like that? Is that something completely different? That's, that's a different wheel. <laughs> Those are the three wheels of learning. Okay. Which are meditation, study, and contemplation. And then there's another version of them as well. No, this is very unrelated. This is a, a description of confusions and sara. Oh, John? You yeah. may have been talking about the three turnings of the wheel of Dharma. That's, that's talking, what I was thinking of. Yeah. The three turnings of the wheel. Um, there, <laughs> there's so many different wheels. The three turnings of the wheel of Dharma refers to three stages of the Buddha's teaching, beginning, middle, and advanced. Um, the three turnings, we are in the beginning. Um, what is this volume called? Volume one. Uh, the path of individual salvation. And this individual is- Individual liberation. Individual liberation. Liberation, that's good. Yes, because this is about liberation. 
Liberation from what? From suffering, believe it or not. If you finish this stage, the so-called Hinayana, lesser vehicle stage, Trungpa Rinpoche called it the foundational stage. This was the first turning of the wheel of Dharma, the wheel of the teachings. And if you accomplish this stage in its entirety, you transcend suffering for the most part. <laughs> it becomes very subtle. And you enter into the reality of the second stage, which is still not enlightenment. And that's called the greater vehicle, the Mahayana. And we'll be getting through, getting to that. And then beyond that is the adamantine vehicle. The Mahayana was taught, the Hinayana was began, began to be taught by the Buddha shortly after his enlightenment. He encountered um, <clears throat> four people with whom he had practiced austerities, uh, yogis. And at first when they saw him, you know, he had taken milk and honey, he had taken nourishment. And uh, then he sat under the Bodhi tree at Bodh Gaya, um, it's now called Bodh Gaya, and uh, he achieved an awakening. When he ran into these four former fellow practitioners, they thought he'd fallen off the path, but then they noticed something different. And they asked him to teach, uh, teach them. And he, all this took place outside of what is now Varanasi um, in um, a place called the, um, what's it called? Um, Sarnath. Uh, there is a grove there and he taught them the four noble truths at Sarnath. This is the first turning of the wheel. And then it was elaborated. And there's a lot of other teachings that are connected and came out of that. The second turning took place sometime later, um, a, again near Bodh Gaya, on Vulture Peak Mountain, it's called, um, north of what is now in the city of Gaya in uh, the province of Bihar. And there the Buddha gave the second turning was the teaching on emptiness. Uh, it's usually referred to as the Prajna Paramita. Prajna is wisdom or transcendent knowledge and Paramita means transcendent virtue. So it's the transcendent virtue of the knowledge which sees non-duality. And that was the second turning of the wheel. The third turning of the wheel, if you're a Vajrayana Buddhist, now, if you're a Mahayana Buddhist, you believe in the first two turnings. If you're a Theravada Buddhist, the second turning didn't happen. <laughs> and if you're a Vajrayana Buddhist, then there was the third turning of the wheel, where uh, the Buddha was summoned by a king in southern India named Indrabhuti. And this king, uh, when the Buddha went there, said to him, look, I'm a king, I've got all my courtiers. We're not gonna become monks and nuns like all your followers. Could you give us a teaching that's appropriate for us? And he gave them the first teaching of the Vajrayana, which was a thing called the Wheel of Time Tantra. Tantra means a very concise, pithy, often difficult text. And it was called the Kala Chakra Tantra, the Wheel of Time Tantra. And supposedly that was the beginning of the Vajrayana. And it went on from there and he taught it elsewhere as well. So those are the three turnings of the wheels of Dharma. Let's move on, talk about the Nidanas. Uh, Mark has his hand up. Mark. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, there you are, Mark. Hi. <laughs> Uh, I just, I wanted to talk, one of the 12 Madonnas is the monkey in the house. Yeah. I always found, I kind of find that interesting, but I'm not sure I have it right as far as, it, it's a metaphor, right? For. Yeah, all of these. Are not, so, you're right, right. right. And uh, the, the monkey represents our neurotic mind. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And the house, does that represent kind of the, the world that we've created past and future kind of thing where we're kind of imprisoned? That's an interesting thought. I think really what the house represents is our body. Okay, no, that's good. That's so, fine, okay. And the monkeys- And, and the windows, the windows are our senses, are the five senses that's and our mind. But also mind, you know, and, right. which is the right. sixth. And, and when we get liberated, if we become in the moment, the house disappears. So does the monkey. <laughs> so, oh well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. 
<laughs> and Frederick hey. is also wanting to say something. And Meg. Yeah. Wow, that, that, was, that was amazing. I, I, I forgot what I was going to ask you for a half a second, but now it, it's coming back to me. Oh, with this, this karmic chain, you know, like I've, I've uh, throughout my life, you know, before I formally encountered the Dharma, I've seen this karmic chain and how it could unravel. And something like when I was five years old, um, I wanted to murder communists. Like I just came out of the womb. I'm like, I'm ready for war. <laughs> and I, I, throughout my life, I would encounter like one of my first mentors and entrepreneurs entrepreneurship I met during like an ayahuasca ceremony was a communist revolutionary and he ended up teaching me like how to be out there and hustle and then uh, like a lot of like just like negative emotion came up and like just learning how to be with that and like something that like dragged me from being lost just hearing about the story of Milarepa and like uh how he what's the word overcame all this negative karmic chain. You know, it's like he committed black magic on like all these innocent people. And that like, according to like the Dharma, you murder someone that that's a big karmic mark. And he knew he had to overcome it. Well, like when he learned about that, he's like, I'm going to do what I got to do. And th this just seems to be coming up with my life. And I'd love to hear your experience and wisdom on this, John. Meditate. There are many stories about uh, people who had terrible karma, who got enlightened. There was, the Buddha had a disciple, uh, can't quite get his name in Sanskrit, but um, he was a murderer and a thief. And when he murdered people, he cut off their fingers and he made them into a, a necklace. And his name was Necklace of Fingers. <laughs> and he became a disciple of the Buddha and got enlightened. Now, that doesn't mean that you get away from your karma. You, you still, you can get enlightened, but if you've got powerful past karma and it's playing out now, it'll carry you right into the future. That's why the Buddha finally died at the age of 60 some odd. That was his past karma, it kept him alive. He wasn't creating new karma. See, to be enlightened is to step out of this story, but you've still got all of the ramifications of your past life and actions in it to deal with. So it's kind of like shit happens. <laughs> kind of like, but you know, um, children in particular, all of us in our youth, we can remember being very in touch with the ground, with the beauty of the world. You know, um, it, it's so much more vivid because a child hasn't developed all of the um, complicated mental apparatus that comes along with as you grow older. And so children in particular tend to see the vividness and the beauty of the ground. And each one of us, I'm sure, could tell stories about from our childhood. Whenever I say, say this, I remember this friend of mine next door when we were about seven years old, six maybe, and there was a stream nearby and we used to go there and play in the stream and catch pollywogs, you know, and bring them home and, you know, try and make them grow into frogs, you know, and, and I just remember the magic of that stream with its skunkweed and um, other things. And there were crawfish underneath the banks of that stream and us wading in it. It's magical. You know, each one of us has memories of that. The ground was very vivid. There's a wonderful poem um, by Wordsworth. Uh, it's called Ode Intimations of Immortality. And it starts out like this. It goes, let me see if I can get it. Um, there was a time when heaven, when there was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth and every common sight to me did seem appareled in celestial light, the glory and the substance of a dream. It is not now as if as it hath been of yore, turn wheresoe'er I may, by night or day, the things which I have seen, I now can see no more. 
as we grow older, the mechanism of neurosis clouds our eyes, but we can remember and we can go back to that. And that's what this path is about. It's about rekindling that vision of this vivid, beautiful world when we cut through our neuroses. And that's really what Tantra is about in particular. It's called luminosity, getting in touch with the luminosity of this world. So yeah, like the, the, the first step of that is cutting through the illusory body, body, right? Like the, you wake up, like you see the dream and then it's like, whoa, there's, there's a lot more water or space or whatever, you know, maybe earth or fire, you know, pick an element to work with here. And speaking of, hold on one second. Yes. Um, there was someone else who had their hand up just a minute ago. Um, Meg, do you still want to yeah. ask? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I, I was wondering about um, the, I think he used, um, or the metaphor for feeling the um, arrow in the eye. Yeah. Which um, seemed kind of harsh. And I, I wondered, uh, I wondered if you could talk about that. Oh, the harshness. I guess it's because when we have these dualistic feelings, you know, which is what this is all about, even pleasure is painful. And what the teachings say to all of us is that if we could see the alternative clearly, we'd know that the pleasure that we pursue is really incredibly painful. I remember Trinko Rinpoche saying that to us one time. If only you could see the alternative, he said, you wouldn't waste a second. And the alternative, you see, is what Wordsworth was talking about in that poem. It goes on, it's a really gorgeous poem, it's very long, about the, the beauty of this world as it arises in the present moment when we have the eyes to see. And by beauty, you know, even the ugliness has its beauty, its power. A dog shit in the street, as we used to say. Death. All of it. These teachings say it's all, all worth being here for. It's our constant desire to get rid of this and to cultivate that that blinds us. What's the name of the Wordsworth poem again? It's called Ode, Intimations of Immortality. So Peter has a question too. Thank you. You're spotting that. Um, hi everyone. Um, my question, John, is when I was reading this, it seems to me that there's a connection between the 12 Madanas and the five Skandhas, um, like form, consciousness, um, that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, are the 12 Madanas an elaboration of the five Skandhas? Yes. Yes, that's pretty good. They are. They're an elaboration of them. And a slight rearrangement. What they're doing is they're rearranging it in time. The five mm -hmm. scandals is just a straightforward progression, you know, from one to the next to the next to the next. These, the first two, are a description of the past, which is causal. Numbers three through three, four, five, six, seven, three through seven are a description of the present, which is resultant. Numbers eight, nine, and ten are causal again, and they're looking to the future. And then 11 and 12 are the future. They're, you know, birth and death. So it's just a different way of coming at it. And it's a more detailed way. And it's, I think it's so interesting that the teachings say that the gap between, or the, in the transition between feeling and desire as it arises. You know, you see something, you get a feeling about it and you want to do something about it. 
you want to draw it to you or push it away, you make love to it or kill it or whatever you want to do. And in that transition between those two, that's where awareness arises, can arise and cut the karmic chain. So what karma really is, you know, being a slave to karma is being caught in the story, the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and what's wrong with us and what we want for our lives and our people around us and who we like and who we don't like and all the rest of it. It's being caught in these stories which change all the time. They're very arbitrary. They have very little appreciation for life as it arises now. This, this whole path is about all of us learning to appreciate and fall in love with our lives as they arise in the present moment and act in the present moment. It's a huge shift from the scheming purposefulness of neurotic mind to appreciation of what happens now, here. but we begin to sense it right from get-go. I think that's why all of us are interested in this <laughs> and are med doing something as crazy as sitting and meditating for an hour. I just want to say something. Jane. Yeah, I was reminded of the, um, the Broadway play in the 60s, I believe, Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. It was, does, does any of you recall that? And that's, um, it's, it won a lot of Tony Awards. It was a musical, uh, no one? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not older than everybody here, but yeah, yeah. Um, it's okay. But when, when I came to the end of, uh, but that's what it reminded me of. I mean, the, 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 the meaning of that is that we get so caught up in the world that it drives us crazy. So how do we get out of that world? And here we're talking about meditation as the way out or meditation plus, let's say, as the way out of the world to become something else. But when I read the last paragraph in, in the chapter on page 79, it's such a dark, the story becomes even darker in terms of if you don't if you don't get in some way off the wheel you have to keep repeating and repeating the whole thing again and again over in the in the the realm of rebirth and death and rebirth and death so um I mean, that could take forever or eons or whatever it takes that that makes this very of uh, the path to me really, really difficult. So could you comment on that, John? Sure. A couple of things. One is when you get to the end of one's life, as we approach the end of our lives, some of us here, right? Doesn't it seem like it just went like that? Just a, It just went in a finger snap. And there's a famous, uh, you know, um, a preliminary contemplation that one does. There's seven of, there are different numbers. One of them is this, that at the moment of your death, the memories of your past life will be of no more significance than last night's dream. Because the only thing that is real is now. And yet, you know, they say <laughs> that each one of us has been through countless lives, died and been reborn again over and over so many times that everyone in this room has been your mother. <laughs> That's a famous <laughs> bit of... <laughs> How about that one? John, Tyler, you've been my mother. 
and I yours. So you could look at it as depressing. I don't. I see that what these things are, are, are offering us is an impetus to practice a, both a negative, there's a carrot and a stick. And the stick is the threat of continuing to wander in samsara over and over again. And the promise, the carrot is to wake up, to awaken. And we can do it. Each one of us, we can do it. We can awaken, we can do it in the instant, just coming present. And if you've got some terrible thoughts going on in your mind, you come present to that. Even that, anything can be the object of awareness in the present moment. And in that awareness in the present moment, there is surcease, there is liberation, there is beauty. And the memories of all the past suffering are just last night's dream. Thank you, that's very helpful. And you're reminding me there comes a point, I don't know if all women um, have this experience, you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, oh my goodness, I've become my mother. <laughs> I don't know if I, yes, I see head shaking. Yeah, and that's a scary moment. And then you, you, you know, you get past it and you accept it, You're almost grateful. But thank you, John, that really is helpful. So John, we have a question from Rika. Rika, hi Rika. Hi, hi everybody. Um, yeah, I have a, um, I have a question. You, you did say something um, towards the end um, that as you as you meditate more, you get more aware of just like a presence and awareness. But the ed the education piece, the knowledge piece, comes later. That you the first level is noticing and being present, but the, 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 the knowledge comes later. And, um, and I think that all of these stories, I feel like for me, I just, I, I wanna learn and understand and, and really get the nuances of every single one of those descriptions. Um, but I, I can also see that I'm grasping because I wanna know these things so much. And I don't really know what I'm trying to say, except I feel like I notice all the time, little tiny parts of all these things I'm looking at. And it's exciting when something that I can feel that's ineffable is isolated and spoken about and written about and discussed and there's a story about it. So I feel like I'm talking around in a circle and I, maybe I'm not making sense, but I think I have an appreciation for these incredible descriptions. But I also feel like there's a grasping on my part because I feel like this excitement and I wanna know all of them now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see a problem. I mean, um, the teachings are beautiful to the extent that which we, you know, to the extent that we learn them and find them useful and understand them and they make sense to us, it's great. The practice, is important. Both of them are important. They work together. And the pra you know meditation practice, it's really important. And if meditation practice is boring, that's good, because it's it's a fail safe that it, meditation practice is boring. It means it's defeating ego's constant desire for entertainment. You know? and really, I think you know if I were to imagine a goal that I want, it's to be back in that stream with the stinkweed and the polywogs <laughs> and, and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the beauty of that day. 
and, and you can have it now, you know, anywhere on the streets of Manhattan, in the mountains outside of Boulder, Colorado, or in the streets of Boulder. It's really waking up to the, the, glo the glory and the substance of the dream that uh, Wordsworth talked about. And this is what Tantra is all about, absolutely. Tantra is all about, and the Shambhala teachings, you know, forget about the current Me Too scandal and all that, the Shambhala teachings are ancient and they're all, all about this, about waking up to the glory and the substance of the dream. The lower teachings in Buddhism are about solving the problem of neurosis, of suffering. The higher teachings are about appreciating the beauty of this world. If we have the eyes to see. And we do, all of us. We've all experienced it in varying degrees. Maybe one more. Kurt? It's getting late. And I'm, so yeah, Kurt. May I? Please. Sorry, Eugene. Um, this, uh, you know, the, this, what you're speaking of this glory and this being in this moment and, uh, that memory, there's, there's times where I find that that is, there's a sense of overwhelm when, uh, that, that fleeting moment when I feel like I'm actually in in the present moment, in that ground, there is a, um, this feeling of overwhelm comes up right away. It's almost an intensity and uh, um, well, maybe fear comes up. It's, uh, that doesn't feel like, you know, it's really the emotion, but it's, uh, it's overwhelming. There's, there's this place that's much more comfortable to be in the thoughts and uh, in my everyday place. I wonder if you can speak to that at all. Yeah. One thing is that the gaps in the thoughts happen all by themselves. You don't have, can't force it. You know, what you can do is just relax. And when they come, they come and then they go and you let them go because you can't hold on to them. The gaps between the thoughts of neurosis. And the second thing is that when you're having fearful thoughts, make them the object of your meditation practice. See them, bring awareness to them. There is nothing that is excluded. It's all grist for the mill. Or the mill of awareness. It's it's ignoble to try and get rid of these things. You know, it's like where we want to pick and choose. It's this is all about appreciation of our lives as they arise now. And by appreciation, I don't necessarily mean that it's pleasant, but you see it. You're there for it. It's a it's it's a challenge to wake up. But really, I don't see that there's anything else that in the last analysis that we can do. Thank you. Thank you. We ought to be able to, um, we ought to stop. I think I'm concerned about people, um, how late it is. And uh, the, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, can you email me the PDF file for the uh, Indestructible Truth? If I've got it, uh, okay. I, 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 I will look. Um, right. okay. I'm not sure that I have it. I, I, I'm, I think, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think I've got it. Uh, but if I, I'll look, if I do have it. Okay. It's an excellent book. Reggie did a great job. He's a wonderful scholar. He's a very devoted Buddhist. And um, well, I've known him for 50 years. And he's a terrific practitioner as well. He used to be head of the Buddhist studies program at Naropa, and he's had a very interesting history. But those books, um, they're, they're, they're sort of, they were written to be college textbooks 
and that yet they're infused with his love and understanding of the Dharma. So they're kind of a combination of those things. I'll send you out the first couple of quatrains, quatrains for the Wordsworth poem <laughs> as well. I'll send that to everybody. So we should end. Thank you. Hey, we, John. Yes. John, did you want to say anything about the scheduling of rep, uh, taking refuge and of the sadhana of, of uh, Mahamudra? Oh, thank you very much, Tully. We're going to do chant the sadhana of Mahamudra this Thursday at 7 p.m., same place. Taking refuge, I want to get through the next few chapters, which are on refuge. And then we're going to schedule a refuge ceremony. Okay. And it's wonderful that um, there are people here who want to take it. And we will do it. We'll do it online. We'll have refuge and bodhisattva vow ceremony. Oh, thank you for reminding me as well. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have, um, I have to be absent on the 27th. We uh, can't have, we're going to cancel class, I think, um, because um, I have to have a medical procedure and nothing serious, but I, it's going to take me out for a few days. But we'll meet next week, and the assignment for next week is chapters um, 10 and 11. It's a bit, bit, bit much of a reading, but uh, it's about 20 pages. I think you can handle it. Oh, wait a minute, excuse me. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Next week, go over the six realms. Yes, because that's what uh, Laura is going to treat. Is that okay, Laura? So just go over the six realms again. I also recommend I send out to everybody the chapter from Cutting Through. I did have the PDF for that. Um, and I recommend that for the six realms too. And we're going to look, go over the six realms and the three worlds, the three datus, which are mentioned in the reading. Okay, so can we do the closing chant? Hold on, let me put it up on the screen. This is the dedication of merit, which is important to do at the end. By this merit, may all obtain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death from the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory. Thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, Thank you, John. Thank you. Wish you well, John. John. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you John. Have a good week. Bye. 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 <laughs> here we are with the diehards. <laughs> 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 Well, live hards. <laughs> of course, right? <laughs> Ellen, I didn't even know you just you were here. You must have been on the third page. <laughs> I was. <laughs> Good to see you. You when too. Want to hear the next stanza of that poem? I'm going to send it. Yes, out. yes, yes. So you had the first one, the glory and the substance of a dream. It is not now as it hath been of yore, turn wheresoever I may, by night or day. The things which I have seen, I now sh can see no more. The rainbow comes and goes, and glorious is the rose. The moon doth with delight look round her heavens bare. The wa waters on a starry night are beautiful and fair. The, the sunshine is a glorious birth. And yet I know, where'er I go, that there hath passed away a glory from the earth. He's talking about it, you know. This is the this is the possession of Buddhists. Right.
No, this word. What this words were. <laughs> he didn't know anything about Buddhism, <laughs> <laughs> but he knew about he knew about seeing, seeing yeah. the world with the eyes of a child and the eyes of you know, he remembered, and he wrote that beautiful poem. It's quite long. It's full of phrases that have come into the language and sort of stuck there. Yeah. You know. You know, when Fred was, uh, I think it was Fred who was saying something before about this, it, Oscar Wilde, I think, has the quote that says, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future, you know. <laughs> Good old Oscar Wilde, God, don't you love him? <laughs> you guys are so beautiful. Huh? You guys are really beautiful. Good looking people. <laughs> Have a good night. Nice to see you, Tony. Take you care. Too. Good, good night. Good night. Night all. Good night.